Hey guys, how's it going, dude? Here I am back with another video. Today I am looking into the mass murderer and terrorist Anders Brevik. Anders Brevik was born on February 13th, 1979, in Oslo, Norway. His father was a diplomat in the Norwegian Embassy in London, so for the first year of Anders' life, he lived in London, England. His mother was a nurse, and at the age of one, his mother and father's relationship turned sour, and so his mother left England and returned to Norway with Anders Brevik. Now, Anders' mother had a great disdain for Brevik, even before he was born, claiming that when the baby kicked, it was done out of spite against her, and after he was born, she just had a great disdain for him, really did not like him at all, called him evil, vindictive, said that he had an intent to destroy her, and was just on a fundamental level evil. She left him by himself for great deals of time at a very, very young age. By all accounts, he was neglected by his mother as a child. But he was under the analysis of child psychiatrists by the age of three or four. Now into his teens, Anders Brevik was arrested a few times, but it was always linked to graffiti and it was always fines never prison time. As he grew up, he would often delve into extremist websites, which is where his ideology began. Anders Brevik is an extremely right-wing individual, and as time went on, he became increasingly isolated and withdrawn from others. Anders Brevik bought a Glock that he called Mjolnir after Thor's hammer. And on July 22nd, 2011, Anders Brevik would change the lives of so many in Norway. In the build-up, Anders purchased chemicals, fertilizer, components for explosives that weighed nearly a ton. And once everything was set and prepared, he drove the van containing the explosives to a government building. This was the Prime Minister's office and the Ministry of Justice. He detonated the explosive that he hoped would level the government building. Instead, the government building managed to stay standing, but unfortunately, eight innocent people were killed and 80 injured. Now, on that day, the Prime Minister was not actually at his office because it's in July in Norway and a lot of people are on holiday, so he didn't feel the need to go into his office that day. He was working elsewhere. He was filmed on CCTV walking away from his van before it detonated in a police uniform. He walked past a man with a bunch of roses and this man thought Anders to be quite suspicious because he was brandishing a pistol and it's very uncommon for Norway police to be armed. He found this so odd and Anders' behavior so suspicious that when Anders went to get into a second van and drive away, the man with the roses decided to note down the registration plate. He noted down the van, make and model. It was a Fiat Doblo and the registration plate was VH24605. Now once the bomb detonated moments later, this man who thought Anders to be incredibly suspicious thought, oh my goodness, I think this man has just detonated the bomb at the government building because he's just walked from that direction. He's been very suspicious and he is brandishing a weapon. He rang the police services and gave a description of Anders as well as the vehicle, the registration plate make and model. This information was put onto a post-it note. The lady that took the information down went to the operations room, walked straight up to the chief of operations desk. The chief of operations was on the phone at the time, but this lady with the post-it note, with this important information, believed she made eye contact with the chief of operations as she placed the note down on the table. So she assumed once the chief of operations was done with the phone call, because you've got to imagine it's pandemonium in the operations room right now, because an explosion has just gone off at a government building in the middle of Oslo, she was expecting the chief of operations 
to look at the note after the phone call. So she walked away and little did she know that that post-it note would not be seen with that crucial information for 30 whole minutes. Instead of this note being picked up in that moment and the information being distributed, the chief of operations, which apparently at the time didn't have much in the way of a procedure for this kind of event, decided to try and get the police that were off duty in. They were calling them individually to try and get them in, all while Anders Brevik was driving to his next location for the second part of his abhorrent plan. Now these crucial minutes where they could have been looking for Anders Brevik in this vehicle with the registration plate, especially as Anders was stuck in traffic for a lot of his journey trying to go through a tunnel, but of course there's been an explosion in Oslo, people are panicking and traffic has come to a halt. He is listening to the radio with great intent and much to his amusement apparently he heard from terrorism experts on the radio them claiming that it was probably Al-Qaeda but of course they could not be more wrong. So unfortunately police were slack to get this information and in this time more and more people claiming to have seen Anders Brevik were bringing in the same information and after 30 minutes all of this information linked up, the note was read, and they put out a message to all of the local police enforcement. And so you'd think that instantaneously the police enforcement would get on finding this vehicle, even though it's been 20, 30 minutes. Every single minute is crucial. Unfortunately, some of the patrol police officers didn't think that the registration, the make and model, the color of the van, and the description of the potential terrorist was too vague for them to follow up. There was a pair of policemen on patrol. Their job that day was to go to a prison, collect a prisoner and return them to Oslo, a transportation job. The chief of operations called them directly and said, do not do that transportation job, find this van. And they ignored their orders because they wanted to just get that job over and done with. There was another patrol car that was on a psychiatric assignment and again, they were told directly to drop what they were doing and find this van and they ignored orders as well. All this time when the van could have been identified because Anders Brevik travelled 40 minutes to the island of Utoya, driving the speed limit completely calm. He drove past a police station, he drove past the US Embassy. There were so many opportunities for the police to intervene if they could have just identified the van in time. Interestingly, the Norway police force only have one helicopter and due to budget cuts in July of 2011, the entire helicopter force was on holiday. However, after hearing about the bombing, one of the helicopter pilots rushed into work to offer his services and he was turned away and told that he was not needed. He was also told that the helicopter was unavailable. This apparently was not the case as the helicopter was on the tarmac and by all accounts was pretty much ready to go if they wanted to use it. As I said, they tried to distribute the information, albeit a little bit late, to the police force. However, they never distributed it to mainstream media, which could have helped apprehend Brevik before he arrived at the island. All of that information about the police, etc., was from an extract of a book called One of Us, which is a combination of witness testimonies, and that was written by Asne Siestad. I apologize if I got the name wrong there, but that is One of Us by Asne Siestad. So Brevik drove 40 minutes to Utoya Island. Now Utoya is owned by the Workers' Youth League, the AUF, a youth group associated with the Labour Party, which holds an annual summer camp there. The island is largely forested with some open spaces. A small pier on the east side of the island is used to ferry people to and from Utoya. On the mainland, there are also permanent buildings. Hovedhuset, the main house, Stuburit, the Horeo, and Laven, the barn, are located together near the dock. Up on the hillside, Lotopen, are the main campgrounds, the cafeteria building, and the sanitary building. Skolastua, 
The schoolhouse is located further south. So the Workers' Youth League, being a youth group associated with the Labour Party, was the prime target of the second part of Anders Breivik's plan, being such a right-winged individual. Now, of course, Anders Breivik was posed as a police officer, and it's believed that he called across to the island posing as said police officer, a security guard, and because they had heard about the explosion in Oslo, claimed that he was there to protect them. So they sent the ferry across, and Anders Breivik boarded the ferry and went over to the island. Not only did he go over the island under the guise of protecting them and went on to massacre them, he also brought across some briefcases, some suitcases, and some of the kids actually helped him with the cases. Little did they know that they were stocked full of ammunition and weaponry that would soon be used against them. So at 5.17, Anders Breivik arrived on the island. At 5.21, just four minutes later, he began mercilessly shooting at everyone that he could see, and within 10 minutes, he had shot and killed 21 people. As he made his way south of the island, he killed a further 15. A lot of people tried to flee the island by jumping into the water, into the freezing lake to try and swim back to shore. Now, some of the survivors claimed that as they were trying to swim back to shore, they realized that they weren't fit enough and so they had to decide in their minds in that moment, do they continue to try and swim and potentially drown or do they swim back before they get to a point of no return and potentially get shot? Imagine for a second having to make that decision. There was one individual who recalls having a gun aimed at him by Anders Breivik, only for Anders to put the gun down and walk away, but not before telling him that he's not going to shoot him because he believes him to look very right wing. By eight minutes past six, Anders had killed 49 people. At 10 minutes past six, he stumbled across 14 people hunkered down, hiding at the pump house. Now, when a police officer had arrived at the pump house, the 14 individuals believed that the shooter that they hadn't seen at this point had been apprehended. Little did they realize that it was Anders Breivik in disguise. And as soon as they let their guard down, Anders shot them all down where they stood. By half past six, Breivik had gone round the entire island, killing a further five people. One minute after the final bullet was fired, Anders Breivik was detained. Now he gave up without a fight, and it's thought that he did this because he wanted to go on to have a bigger platform to spread his horrendous ideology. He shot people for an hour on that island. He killed 69 individuals on the island, the youngest being just 14 years old. And as I said earlier, eight at the government building, bringing the total to 77 innocent people that lost their lives that day. Anders Breivik to this day claims that it was a political act. Apparently after the shooting, Anders Breivik complained about a cut to his finger that he apparently got from a skull fragment after he shot someone in the head. After everything that he had done in the last hour, two hours, to complain about that shows just how deranged this individual is. Now, under Norwegian law, the maximum jail sentence is 21 years. He used his trial to get recognition for his actions and claimed that he wanted to start a revolution and get rid of the immigrants in Norway. There was a 1,500 page manifesto that he had created that before going out to do the bombing and the shooting, he emailed out to 1,000 email addresses. He saw himself as the perfect Aryan race, incredibly right wing, incredibly racist individual. The level of narcissism in Anders Breivik is almost unparalleled and he has famously said since the abhorrent acts that he made that day that his only regret is that he regrets not killing more 
people. So there we go, guys. That is Anders Brevik and the abhorrent things that he did on July 22nd. 2011. Let me know what you guys think down below. If you could like, share and subscribe, that would mean a lot to me. We're really close to 100,000 subscribers now. I have a podcast you may be interested in, the Allegedly Possibly Maybe podcast. So if you like true crime, paranormal, conspiracies, etc., please do go and check that out. Thank you so much for supporting me, guys. I really appreciate it. I will see you very soon. Sweet one, geese.